Tonight, three of the best, brightest, and boldest Minnesota personalities, world-class bicycle champion Greg LeMond, innovative New Age composer Yanni, and the controversial leader of KSTP's media dynasty, Stanley Hubbard. Their stories and more on a Pat Miles special. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight. Now, before you get any wild ideas out there, yes, I am sitting on the news set at Channel 5, and no, I haven't left Channel 11 for a job here. But in this business, anything can and does happen, and nowhere has that been more evident in the past few years than here at Channel 5. Stan Hubbard, the man who owns this company, has been in the headlines time and time again over the comings and goings of the anchor people who have sat behind this desk. People like Ron Major, Cindy Brucato, Marsha Fleur, Bob Vernon, Dennis Felkin, Roy Fenden, Skip Losher, Randall Carlisle, Tom Ryther, Ruth Spencer, Barry Zavant, whew, just to name a few. They've all come and gone. And the high-profile turnover has made Stan Hubbard one of the most well-known and controversial personalities in the Twin Cities. But tonight we're going to talk to the man behind that all-business image, a man who surprised us and who may end up surprising you. I am an honest person. I'll look in that camera and tell you I'm an honest person. I don't tell lies. And uh, sometimes they, sometimes they get you in trouble. Later tonight on tour with Yanni, the Greek-born musician got his start in a popular Twin Cities rock band called Chameleon. But now he's one of the hottest new age composers in the country. Yanni talks about his life, his music, and his relationship with former Dynasty star Linda Evans. Well, she has called you the sexiest man she's ever known. Well, now, that's quite a statement I, to be the sexiest <laughs> man that Linda Evans has ever I known. I paid her a lot of money to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Good, Greg Limon. And an American superstar on the pro cycling circuit. Greg LeMond is on course to claim his fourth Tour de France championship this summer. Between his Wyzetta and Belgium homes, Greg shares his thoughts about being showered with a hero's adoration in Europe in a sport that gets little recognition in his own country. I, I, I have no intentions of wanting to be a superstar like a Mike Tyson or a Bo Jackson. I mean, I would like to have the respect of those athletes, but I have that respect you know, you know, almost everywhere in the world. So what are Eleanor Mondale, Gretchen Carlson, and Garrison Keillor up to these days? Later on, we'll check in with these familiar faces from past shows to find out how their lives have changed. But tonight, we begin with Stanley Hubbard and his media dynasty when we come right back. Well, my dad used to always, uh, always preach at us and anybody who listened that if you serve the public, Profits will take care of themselves. It was like a family farm, a family business. You grew up in, in it, and you lived it, and you ate it, you breathed it, you slept it. And everything revolved around the family business. It will always be changing. That's the nature of our country. And we stop changing, we're in deep trouble. Broadcasting is a media marvel, with nine radio and television stations across the country, a national satellite gathering news operation, and a 24-hour news channel that could soon be broadcast worldwide. The company is well known in broadcasting circles for its willingness to risk, to innovate, a reputation that started with radio pioneer Stanley E. Hubbard, who in 1948 decided television was the future. TV was considered risky back then, but Hubbard ignored the naysayers and proceeded to build a broadcasting empire, beginning with KSTP, one of the nation's first television stations. Today, though, it is his son, Stanley S. Hubbard, who is in charge, the second-generation broadcaster who says he learned the business from his dad. I remember the day the war started, in 1941, December 7th. I remember going down to the studios with him that day and spending all day with him, and I just grew up doing that. That's how I really learned the business. Was it his dream that you would following his footsteps? Oh yes, we, we were a family business and I knew from the time I was a little kid, just like our kids have, and once again I go back to the Minnesota family farm, that <clears throat> if I did what I should be doing and if I really kept my nose to grindstone, that one day it would be mine. Or ours, you know, the, the families. 
Today, all five of the Hubbard children have a hand in running some aspect of the business. Daughter Jenny is general manager of KSTP AM radio, and Stan's son, also named Stanley, oversees the Kona's communications operation. It was always the dinner table conversation. It was, it was a day off from school over here at the office, uh, hanging around the television and radio stations. It just all felt so natural. You know, it wasn't anything very conscious even. It, it just was there and, and exciting. I do know that it was just, it's just kind of one of those things that seems to be in your blood or gets into your blood over, over time. What is it about this business that you are so in love with? We're a part of the community. Whatever happens, if you're in the media business, a newspaper, a radio, or television, you're a part of what goes on. And for the last 20 years, Stan Hubbard has been a part of everything that's gone on at the station, including hiring market research guru Frank Maggot. With the help of clients like Stan Hubbard, Maggot has built his own empire researching public opinion about television news. His company is headquartered in Iowa, but today he spends most of his time at his home in Santa Barbara. Yes, he's a client, but more than that, he's my best friend. I think the thing that attracted me to Stanley, uh, and that I think would be an attractive thing to virtually anyone, uh, would be uh, an absolute honesty. Uh, he is very direct. He is very honest. Uh, he doesn't, in common parlance, play games. And I think, to a large degree, he responds very well to people who have information and ideas, because that's the world that he lives in. Hubbard's world also includes ratings. And Frank Maggot's research on how to improve them with new anchors at Channel 5 hasn't been of much help in the past several years. In fact, Stan Hubbard's reputation has suffered because of the steady stream of new talent behind the news desk. He says it's been a real heartbreak for him that his research, his testing, hasn't completely panned out for Channel 5. Well, actually hasn't panned out well recently at all. It will. You know, if they, you know you've been in this business long enough to know that things... What goes around comes around, and if for whatever reason people don't watch somebody on the air, it's like a quarterback, if he can't throw the football and get touchdowns, the person won't be quarterback very long. And if an anchor person cannot attract audience, then the person's in the wrong job. Well, I don't want to belabor the point, but, but I guess what, what I'm really asking is there's been research that Frank has done for the yeah. station that has just been wrong. No, the research hasn't been wrong, the implementation's been wrong, or something has happened along the way. Uh, uh, a good example is uh, when I when we we had an anchor change after Ron Majors left, and we I wanted it was my great brainstorm is that we would have a completely separate team at six and at ten. We'd have a strong male and a strong female at ten, and a strong male and a strong female at six, and these two shows would be entirely different shows. Well, right away when he tried to do that, it was picked up in the newspapers as, boy, we're demoting somebody. All that publicity really and truly hurt, and the new anchors didn't have a chance. You felt the paper was out to get oh, you? Oh, there was no question about it, because I, if something that happened to KSB, it would be a big deal, and something that happened to one of the other stations, it would be played down. But how did that happen? I mean, that, that you've become so associated with the, talent, with the talent and with the revolving door. Our family owns the station, and we're willing to talk. And when people, you know, it's one thing when you're talking about a station that's owned by out-of-towners, such as your station, it's owned by Gannett, big company and headquartered in the Washington, D.C. area, and it's kind of like by remote control. Well, here it isn't. We live here. And um, maybe it's a mistake, but when I, I answer my own phone, people call me at the office. If I'm there, I pick up the phone. I pick up the phone and some reporter. And I'm sure, I'll talk to him. So I'm an easy mark. Stanley is not only misunderstood, but unfortunately he is maligned. When you really look at the record, that the quote-unquote revolving door that exists there is no more of a revolving door than you will find in virtually any other television station in the country, perhaps even less so in many cases, and even in the market. The fact is that I believe that much of this uh, has been made more of than the facts would warrant. He is a lightning rod and takes the heat, if you will, for what others may have done. You recall that Ron Majors worked for us. And Ron Majors was very good. He's a terrific, terrifically talented guy. 
And everybody knows because Ron Majors gave an interview to the newspapers that he got involved in drugs, cocaine and a lot of alcohol. And when Ron went to treatment and then left the station, it turned into something, you know, the terrible revolving door at Channel 5, and Ron Majors has left. There's nothing I could have done about that. There's nothing I can do about a person who went through treatment and wants to remake their life and wants to move on to a different city. One of the things that baffled me when I was work working on some of the other interviews for this story, but I couldn't get an interview with, with Stan Turner or with Ron Majors or with Cindy Brucato or with um, Bob Jordan, and on and on and on and on. Everybody was afraid to be interviewed. No, I don't think Ron Majors is afraid. I think that Ron's doing very well in Chicago. He's got his act together. He's a happy, happy, I think, well-adjusted person who's doing well. And uh, why bring up old things? Cindy Bucato, I, I talk to Cindy all the time, and I think she probably didn't talk to you because we're friends. Uh, Stan Turner uh, has worked for me for a long time, and he probably figures it's you know, best just to not say anything. Who else did you talk to? Quite a few people, but uh, there, there did seem to be a little bit of an element of fear about it. I, I wouldn't understand the fear. I think a lot of people are afraid to talk about Stan Hubbard and Hubbard Broadcasting and their experiences at KSTP because to them, it's like opening up a wound. And for me, it's not like opening up a wound. It's like opening up a very bright chapter in my life, which had kind of a dismal ending. Marsha Fleur worked at Channel 5 for more than a decade until she was demoted from her position as weekend anchor. I never feared him because I always thought that what he appreciated most was a good argument. <laughs> that when he barked, if you barked back and could make your points, you could win. And very few people with that much power will ever let you win. This is a man who can pull rabbits out of hats. There's the, the hardline, bottom line businessman and there's also the secret philanthropist. That's a legacy from his father, that there is, without tuning horns or making a big deal about it, he has saved lives of alcoholic employees, uh, made sure that bills were paid when life looked hopeless for a lot of people. One of Hubbard's many benefactors is Dave Stevens. Born with no legs, Hubbard saw Stevens playing football on the television program That's Incredible. Nice made the comment to Fran Tarkton, well, someday I hope to replace Howard Cosell. And two weeks later in the mail, I get this letter from Stanley Hubbard saying, we'd like you to come up to Minnesota and start on your way to replacing Howard Cosell. You can start an internship as soon as you want, and we'd be glad to, to help you out. Dave is now a full-time sports producer at Channel 5. I think there's a fine line of, of what he will offer you, but what you need to do for yourself. He'll say, all right, you, you have this job, but you better make sure that you do a good job and that you work hard and, and, you know, I'm still here. What he expected in return was extreme loyalty. And I think if he has a flaw, it's that he didn't understand that he had it. Hubbard and his wife Karen live in a quiet, secluded area along the St. Croix River. They are known as generous neighbors here. When Stan Hubbard saw some of the local children skating in the ditches of the road one winter, he helped pay for a public hockey and figure skating arena for the entire valley. The thing I like most to do in the world was play hockey when I was a kid. I was never very good. I was never a star. I remember when I first moved here reading about Stanley Hubbard preempting programming to put on hockey. Once again, some of the newspapers picked it up and said, Stanley Hubbard's carrying a hockey game because his kids playing for the team. But what you didn't read was, we had a little idea which has become Conus Communications. And we wanted to find out whether or not we could transmit a hockey game by a little portable satellite truck. We could not tell anybody what we were up to. So we picked up on a couple Sunday afternoons that I can remember the uh, St. Paul Vulcan hockey team and we used a little satellite dish and we proved that it worked. 535 K288. 535 uh, K288. Conus Communications became the first satellite news gathering organization in the country. But now Hubbard has turned his attention to DBS, Direct Broadcast Satellite. Ten years ago, he applied for the first permit in the country and in 1994 will launch his own multi-million dollar satellite into space. In the meantime, Hubbard spends every waking moment trying to convince anyone who will listen that DBS will change television forever. 
I'm going to be on a panel at 9 o'clock tomorrow. Last month, I traveled with Hubbard on his corporate plane to the annual National Association of Broadcasters Convention in Las Vegas, where he went about the business of lobbying for his vision of the future. And I think if you're a smart guy today and you're in cable and you're in broadcasting, you get into the next step, the DVS thing, because you ought to be a part of what's going to change the world and not sit and watch the world go by, as many of us did when cable came along. Could I respond to that? Stan, you're wrong. Uh, uh, the, uh, no, I, I don't think I think it, I'm right. I'll send you my one. And it's an oxymoron to think that you're going to get this cheaper through the telephone company than, than having it free through cable right now. Am I missing something here? I guess I'm missing something. I mean, I know if a person wants to put an antenna on their house and live in Miami, Florida, they can watch Bill Station for free. But am I missing something? Isn't there a basic charge for cable? Well, there's a basic, there's a basic charge for cable, but I'm, I'm talking about your delivery system. I mean, you're not paying anything to cable for to have your signal delivered. Well, cable was built on the backs of broadcasters. But isn't there a basic charge? Not, not, not to the broadcast television station. Oh, but there's a basic charge to the public. Oh, absolutely. Just like there's for telephone. Oh, sure, but... The one, the one thing there will not be a basic charge for... <laughs> Here's what Bill does and what this is going to do. No. It's all a la carte, folks. Take no, what you want. You're taking a risk. Does it scare you at all? It's not frightening, and, it, and if we are successful, it's going to be wonderful for Minnesota because it'll, because it'll be headquartered here. And it'll make, if it works, it'll make Minnesota a national media center, which I'd love to see happen. You are really Minnesotan through You're and through. You're darn tootin' I'm Minnesotan. I live here, and our family lives here. And I've had people who are... Uh, who are partners in our CONUS communications and who are investors in our direct broadcast satellite venture who say, why in the world do you have that in Minnesota? You know, the taxes are terrible. And why not put it someplace else? Well, I'm fortunate. I love here. I, love, I live here. I love it here. I'm going to stay here. And I'm going to tough it out. Still ahead, ride along with Greg LeMond on the treacherous pro cycling circuit in Europe and catch up with past guests Eleanor Mondale, Gretchen Carlson, and Garrison Keeler. But first, Former Minnesota rocker Yanni shines on the New Age stage and woos the love of his life, actress Linda Evans. The music you're listening to will fill the hall here at the Orpheum Theater in just a few days. The performer is Yanni, a Greek-born New Age composer whose musical roots were sown in Minnesota rock and roll. In fact, following his recent solo success, the former Chameleon Band member still surrounds himself with friends and business associates from this area. But today, Yanni lives and works in Hollywood, California, where he spends most of his time in the studio composing the music he says will still be popular 100 years from now. One thing I know is that ever since I was a kid, I um, felt the love for the music. I mean, I always felt it and emotionally involved in it. I, when I heard music that I really connected with, it would stir me emotionally. But we were always taught in my family that music was to be learned so that we become better human beings and use it as a friend for the rest of our lives, um, but not as a profession to make money with or living with. It wasn't until I was, I would say, 21 or 22, after I graduated from college, that I r became strong enough, I think, within myself and I asserted myself and realized that I could live life the way I want to. I knew within three months that music was going to be it. Did you know you were going to be a success, Yanni? I mean, was that, was that something that when you, when you finally decided, I'm going to be a musician, I'm going to compose? Yeah, I, I mean, I, you don't embark on a trip 
this long, and it's, it's a hard one, and it's a very uncertain one, uh, without knowing. And I learned that very early on because I was an athlete. And I remember from the coaches that I have had, they said right before the race, if you don't know you're going to be number one, you won't. <laughs> don't worry, it won't happen. Yanni was born and raised in Kalamata, Greece. But after high school, encouraged by his family to come to the United States, where his dad believed he would have a better future, he enrolled at the University of Minnesota and graduated with a psychology degree in 1976. It was during these early years in college that Yanni met and began working with several local musicians and for the first time started to think about music as a profession. Eventually, he joined a popular local rock and roll band called Camellia. In fact, I think it's probably one of his dark little secrets that the rest of the country doesn't know about or are not aware of, you know. Dugan McNeil co-wrote songs and played with Yanni in Camellia. He remains one of Yanni's closest friends. I called him up. I thought he was an Indian. <laughs> I, 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 Why is that? I don't know. I, I had never heard a Greek accent before. And uh, I called him up and talked to him. And, and I told the band, I said, yeah, I just talked to this, this keyboard player. And I think, he's in, I think he's like an East Indian or something. So uh, they were open-minded. And I was open-minded. And he, <laughs> he came over and he was, he was this Greek guy. And uh, we hit it off just like, I don't know, it was a real spiritual kind of thing. band was together for about five years and I think the band was one of the first ones around here to be doing a total original kind of a project. People weren't used to seeing a real theatrical presentation. The show was bombs and rockets and I remember Yanni saying um, here's how the, he'd get just wired and he'd say here's how the show starts we come out and four bombs go off and the lights come on and then it goes straight up from there. He was very visual as well as being musically creative. He knew exactly what his angles were. He knew exactly where the fog had to go, the light. And he was real specific about what, what should be done. When Chameleon broke up, Yanni signed a deal with private music. Albums, tours, and his personal career began to take off. And Yanni's success meant success for his friends. Joe Stafford, a photographer for Chameleon, went on to shoot album covers for Yanni's first two releases. And Tom Paskey, who managed Chameleon, now heads Yanni's business affairs. I think he continues with us sometimes out of a loyalty, but there's a trust thing there, too. He doesn't trust very easily, but then uh, when he does, it's just kind of forever. You know, he's in L.A. now, and in L.A., people tend to tell you things that you want to hear. I guess from Minneapolis, knowing him from 10 years ago, we don't bother to do that. Minneapolis is just a great city, but it's fairly safe compared to Los Angeles or New York. So I felt, don't ask me why, <laughs> I needed more punishment. <laughs> I needed the, the, the exposure to, to this sort of atmosphere. At Yanni's home in Hollywood, the spare bedroom has been converted into a studio. This is where he slips away to record his albums. He is a self-taught musician with a natural gift of perfect pitch. So does it mean, Yanni, that any, I could play any note and you would know exactly what it was? Yeah. yeah. Without looking. All right, so, so okay, turn around. Without looking. So turn around. All right. Without looking. You ready? Yes. That's a G. It's an E flat. It's a D and an E together. That's very <laughs> <laughs> That one was good. Where do your songs come from, Yanni? I mean, do you hear, um, like they say, writers hear voices and characters speaking? I mean, uh, do you have this commotion going on in your head? Yeah, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> I hear notes. I hear everything. The interesting thing is that. When you are creative, when your sp the spark comes to where you really know, you cannot observe yourself doing it. The minute you observe yourself, if you say, ah, it's happening, it's gone. Music to me is not um, an exercise. It's not a matter of being clever with how you position certain notes. It's, it's a way of talking. You tell a story. I happen to believe that music is extremely accurate at conveying 
and describing very um, subtle emotions. So it is a, it's a great level of communicating. Jill is much more expressive with the music than I've ever seen her. One of the people drawn into Yanni's fold by his music is figure skater Jill Trinnery. In 1990, she won the world championship skating to one of his songs. Now he is working on an original score for her performance at the 1992 Olympics. Music is so important for our sport, it's just unbelievable. You can go out there and do six triples, but it doesn't matter if you're just going out there and not, you know, emoting, expressing yourself to the music at all. And with music like Yanni's, I just, I feel for me that it clicks. And it's also even more special because he's my friend and, and we're doing this together. and. It's, there's a little a special place in my heart for him, and when I'm out there, that will be with me. It's very exciting. I'm gonna, I, I've gotten videotapes of your routine, and I'm sort of studying it, and I'm going to score it like a picture. The beauty of doing it this way, I think, is that she, the timing of the music will be to facilitating with her routine. I, I don't think it's ever been done before. Communicating. Yeah. yeah. Well, since you brought it up, Yanni, I mean, somebody you communicated to your girlfriend, Linda Evans. How did that happen? I connected with her on a, on a really great human level, but I never have done that with another woman in my life before. His music is exceptional to me. Uh, so exceptional that uh, for the first time in my life, I made a phone call to somebody to say, I love what you do. So you really didn't know what he looked like or no. how old he was or any no. of the details. <laughs> If I had seen him, I know I wouldn't have called him. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true, Linda? Oh, yeah. No, because then I would have said, you see, the first time I looked at him, I fell in love with him. So, I mean, then what would I do? Call him on the phone? I would die. It would be terrible. <laughs> Since Dynasty went off the air, Linda has time to follow Yanni on tour. She was with him earlier this month at his concerts in Norfolk, Virginia, and the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. Uh, Yanni, he's a pretty demanding guy. Got to be ready. Okay, you guys ready to go up real soon here? <laughs> There's ten of us on stage. Somewhere between my first band and the symphony orchestra concerts. <laughs> this group will have the capability of creating such a variety of sounds from song to song that normal bands can't do. I mean, one time we can sound like a symphony orchestra, the next time we could sound like a rock and roll band. <laughs> I suppose they put me in new age category because they don't know what else to do with me. I'm this instrumental artist that basically does a lot of different types of sound and attitude about music. I think the mystery of it really is part of the magic of it because he feels it so intensely because it's so real for him and because he's not afraid of feelings or emotions. And then he's able then to create them. No, I you don't care. That one. <laughs> No, you everybody scream? else was screaming. You were screaming right from oh, the get-go. Yeah. Who was screaming during Reflection of Sebastian? There was somebody who was yelling. We're not happy together or together because she understands my music. I think maybe that was an introduction. It, it's sort of a silly analogy here, but I feel like a bird. You know, birds do their songs to attract their mates. I think that people are fascinated by your romance. Definitely has helped me in my career. Absolutely. It has... Uh, attracted the public's attention to me. In the final analysis, the music and what I do and what I'm all about has to stand on its own. It will never and I will never succeed just because Linda and I are romantically involved. We're in Washington. It's absolutely beautiful. Gorgeous. We'll see what it's going to sound like. I need more experiences in life. And that's how I intend to keep it fresh. That's how I intend to keep my audience interested in me. Linda many times has said that success is a great, the greatest seductress. Unless you really know who you are, 
So when people praise you, you still know who you are. And when they put you down, you still know who you are. And if you can do that, hopefully you'll survive the experience. Up next, an inspirational comeback by the world's premier cyclist, Greg LeMond, after a gunshot wound nearly ended his life. If you've been in a cycle shop recently, you've no doubt noticed the LeMond name on some of the bicycles and equipment. Greg LeMond, the first American ever to win the Tour de France, now on a course to become the first rider ever to win the Tour a record six times. I had a vague idea of Greg LeMond's accomplishments, but it wasn't until I followed him during bike races this spring in France and Belgium that his athletic greatness really sunk in for me. I had no idea what kind of physical and mental toughness it takes to become a winner on that tour. I had no idea what kind of inspirational story Greg LeMond had to tell. So I came home a new fan of bicycle racing and especially of Greg LeMond. Toward the finish, he assumes that aerodynamic position on the bike. His name is Magic, and in France, Greg LeMond is magnifique. The first American ever to wear the yellow jersey as the winner of the Tour de France. 23-day, 2,000-mile bike race through the mountains of the Pyrenees and Alps. The Tour is the most popular sporting event in the world, with more spectators than the Super Bowl, World Series, and Olympic Games combined. Greg LeMond has won it three times. Cycling is traditionally a European sport, so while you might not be aware of his superhuman feats on a bicycle, overseas Greg battles crowds of autograph seekers, many of whom just simply want to see or touch their hero. What a contrast when he visits his part-time home in Minnesota where most people don't recognize Greg. In fact, most Americans aren't sure who Greg LeMond is or what his sport is all about. Okay. It's a fact Greg has come to accept, and something we talked about when I visited with him this spring at his home in Belgium. I'm tired of hoping that it's going to be a big sport in America, because it won't. I know there's, when I won the Sports, Sportsman of the Year for uh, Sports Illustrated, there are a lot of grumbling <laughs> sports journalists throughout the U.S. Uh, it's mainly because they've never seen the Tour de France. And once you see it, and even as a cyclist, each time I go there, here I've competed in every event throughout the year, you're still awed by the, the hardness of it. Do you have like a, a first memory of cycling and knowing that this was something you connected with? Uh, my very first memory of, of uh, cycling was watching the 1972 Olympics. At the time, I had no idea of what cycling was, and I turned off the TV because I thought it was boring. <laughs> typical American. Yeah, typical American. Well, you, anything that you don't understand ends up being boring. So uh, I never thought about cycling. and I, I worked and cut lawns during the summer and bought a, a bike uh, just to ride, get around. And then I, I also, at the time, uh, really liked downhill skiing. I was into freestyle skiing. And we had a drought that winter, and I ended up riding my bike straight through the winter and met somebody from Reno uh, that was in, in a racing club, and they got me into cycling. And then from that point on, I became a fanatic. Well, that's what I mean. I mean, there are, you know, the only thing that comes to my mind, it's like somebody swings a golf club and they can connect with the ball the way nobody else can. And you sort of know, hey, I think I have a talent for this. Was there that kind of a moment? Yeah, the, I just, it felt, I, I think... After about six months of riding, I mean, it was obvious I had natural talent for that type of sport. Okay. It's a thinking man's endurance sport. And the whole time you're racing, there's so many things that are going on. Uh, you have to constantly be thinking of tactics. It's, it's a sport where you can draft, save energy. Sometimes it's never the, most of the time, it's never the strongest who wins. It's the guy who's sometimes the smartest. And, uh, Somehow I had a natural talent for that, plus I had the physical uh, talent. But my interest to go to Europe is what really 
I mean, that's what really kept me going. I, I made long-range goals, and, you know, I had uh, visions of me becoming like Eddie Merckx or Bernard Hinault, uh, the, the so-called European superstars. And you did. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's, when I look at it now, it's, I mean, I've achieved basically everything I, I, I had hoped to set out and do. Here's the Champs, there's the Arc de Triomphe. Today, Greg speaks French fluently and can maneuver his way around Paris traffic like a pro. You go along the river, then you come back up. And it ends exactly where? Uh, down at the very bottom of the Champs-Élysées. Every time I come onto the Champs-Élysées, I get goosebumps. I mean, it's something I'm going to dread quitting cycling. It's it's going to, you know, to lose that feeling, that sensation. You know, watching you in France and in Paris, you seem so so much a part of this country and this city. I mean, well, I've they love here. you. I mean, you're a part of them, it seems like. Well, in the last couple of years, I'd say my first part of my career was, you know, I was, it was hard to be accepted as the American coming here. And since I learned to speak French a lot better than in my first uh, part of my career, and the fact that I've been on a French team most of my life, uh, most of my career, uh, has really helped. And they have, before I was always competing against their national hero, Bernard Hinault. And when he retired, it seems like they adopted me as their uh, their yes, rider. Hero. Right. Well, their rider from from France. 40, Greg the Camembert race is named for France's most popular cheese. It starts right outside Paris and then winds north through Normandy, the northern part of France, famous for its lush meadows and rich dairy production. But for Greg, the Camembert is more than anything else a training race and a chance for the fans to see this world-renowned cyclist. Following Greg and the rest of the Z riders is coach Roger Legay, who drives the team car. These team cars, which travel behind the pack and are radioed to the front for equipment, extra clothing, or advice on strategy, are an integral part of each race. What I want people to understand, Greg, is, is how difficult it is physically. That's, it's so hard to explain because... There's no way to do it? <laughs> it's not always, you know, we do a 120-mile race, which might take five hours or six hours. And it doesn't mean we just go out. You know, the, the real stuff that hurts is the intensity stuff. In cycling, you've got to be able to have that energy or that power, but you also have to have the endurance legs. You don't push yourself just to your capabilities or what you're feeling like in cycling. you got to push yourself be able to stay up with your other competitors. But how do you keep yourself so on top of it? I mean, it's, well, I don't it's physically demanding the way no other sport. It's hard for people to understand that it's impossible for an athlete, especially a cyclist, and especially me as I'm getting older and, uh, I don't know, I find it harder to get in shape. Uh, it's hard to be on top all the time. And out of, I do 100 to 130 races a year, out of those races, uh, only 30% of them I might be competing well in. Okay, I'll carry Simone down. Somebody else can carry her up. <laughs> <laughs> Climbing up a mountain cliff with her three small children in tow is all in a day's work for Kathy Lamond. She's been with Greg since the beginning of his professional career. She is the one he turns to for support. And Kathy has always been there to give it. Are you a true fan of the sport now or just in yeah, terms of Greg? No, it is really a great sport. It is, it's got a lot of tradition behind it, so it's hard maybe for an American to feel what a European feels. But, I mean, it is a great sport. If, if I can't imagine another sport where for sometimes two or three hours you are on the edge of your seat ready to die. You know, the mountain stages are incredible. Oh, Greg, I don't see him. Oh, I feel so bad for him. Is this bad? Well, yeah. There's no way he's this far behind. No way. I'm hoping he didn't crash. Oh, I don't know what to think. I'm going to go to his hotel. <laughs> Are you okay, Greg? Yeah. I just have a real sore knee start. And, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to get you to brag or anything, but I mean, you have been more than supportive, it seems to me. Well, um, before his accident, I would have said maybe he would have made it without me. But since his accident, I know he wouldn't have made it without me. Greg Mamani was shot by his brother in law Pat, and he was just like, he can't make it, he's not coming back. The accident took place in 1987. Sure, Greg know. was turkey hunting in California when his brother-in-law, Pat, accidentally shot him in the back. I thought the gun went off like about a yard away. And I went to stand up, and I was like, I went to say, who shot? Who shot? And my right lung was collapsed. 
If I was any closer, I would have, eased, I would have died for sure. Facing a recovery complicated by an appendectomy, Greg was systematically dropped from his team, dropped by his friends and racing associates. Otto Jacom was the exception. Really, everybody turned their back on me. I mean, just they just saw no hope. I mean, guys who were supposedly your friends just, you know, they just took, wrote you off. And uh, that's where I really absolutely need somebody on a team like Otto, I'm sure. But he was, he's been like a, I used to think he was a father figure, but now he's more like a brother figure uh, since I was 15 years old. Today, Jacom works with the Z team as Greg's personal masseur and training assistant. Uh, it's nice when Otto comes on the motorcycle and uh, motor pacing. We do, the cyclists do a lot of training behind a motorcycle. It simulates race pace. Uh, makes you you're able to concentrate a little bit more and go race pace levels and that's what Otto's good at. In cycling you, you don't just don't go out and ride you always go out and do specific workouts. You always have to train it train into very good intensity which takes concentration uh, and that gets that gets very very hard as you get older. Aren't you with Lamo? No, <laughs> I'm his brother. <laughs> Can I have your center for a yeah. branch out of this? Sure. What is it about Greg that <coughs> has made that attraction? He's not only a great okay. athlete. Yes, thank you very much. But he's yes. a great a person. He's very tender, soft, nice guy. You know, you think he's a very tough guy because he killed those guys in the big, big humongous races, though. But behind all that, those, that strength and all that tough guy is, is a heart with, with very nice feelings, though. Heart of gold. Yes. Bike designers would go crazy if they saw that. Manufacturers like to claim you can make up this much time and that much time with this piece of equipment. Uh, it's all, you know, theory in the lab. And when it comes to real there. life, it's another thing. So here's the pattern. We're going to start out here on the bullhorn, position one. Then I'm going to flag it, and we'll go to narrow position on the clip-on. When Greg won the Tour de France by eight seconds in 1989, he used the tri-bars, developed by his friend and American cyclist Boone Lennon. Greg has continued his work with Lennon. Last January, they traveled to Texas A&M University for a series of wind tunnel tests. The very, very low ones I had the least amount, but that was too uncomfortable for me to race. I went down there, and I found out that the, the bars made up about a 15 second. Uh, 15 to 20 second advantage over my natural position because I have a very good natural position, very aerodynamic. What about the criticism you've had, uh, Greg, about being so commercial or the money? You've really changed the sport in terms of the salaries, haven't you? You know, in America, sports is big business, and I came here with a little more American education, and I always felt like when I came in to talk down, sit down and talk about a contract, yeah, I'm not going to be, you know, it's hard to negotiate an athlete against three executives. Uh, they're going to have three executives and against me. I want to at least have my dad or an attorney with me. And I feel like I'm responsible for changing the sport. And I'll tell you, there's more riders right now making a lot more money than they ever were five, six years ago. Greg has completely changed cycling for women because he has said to his team, I don't care. If you want me, you take her too. And nobody else with the status that Greg had ever wanted their wives there. Unlike most riders' wives who are invisible on the racing circuit, Kathy Lamond is well known, a full-fledged partner in Greg's career. At the Tour of Flanders race in Belgium this spring, one of the most important spring classics, Greg threatened not to race that day unless Kathy was allowed to go along in the team car. Do you look back on those early years and wonder how you did it? Yes, I, I never, ever, ever could do it again, never. I mean, did you see success down the road? I mean, did I think you we must have, or we would have given up. I had so much blind confidence in Greg at such a young age, and he, he was such a great guy that, hey, I didn't care if we ever made it. I mean, he was just great. He, he is great to be with. And so it never seemed like a sacrifice. The only time it seemed like a sacrifice was when he was away for so long. I spent 200 nights a year in a hotel or more. I'm gone from my family most of the year. She doesn't complain. She's really helped me. I could never have done my sport without her. There's no doubt. 
uh, my whole family, her family too, has been very supportive. So it's, I mean, it's, it takes, it's a team effort. And Greg is quick to give his family the credit for his success. Success that was finally rewarded in the United States last February when Greg received the Jesse Owens Award as the world's most outstanding athlete. Aside from his unquestioned superiority as a cyclist, Greg Lamond has also established himself as a giving, caring young man, a most worthy recipient as the world's most outstanding athlete, February 5th, 1991. If you were to win three more tours, though, Greg, that would be the most anyone's ever won. Well, see, I mean, that's definitely a nice goal. I mean, that's something that's in the back of my mind. I'm the most happy I've ever been in cycling. Just, I, I really enjoy the sport right now. Yeah, I could do this for another four or five years. Coming up next, the latest news on what three former guests are up to when a Pat Mile special continues. As you can see, there's not a lot left of the old WLOL studios in downtown Minneapolis. Last fall, after we profiled Eleanor Mondale, who worked as a DJ here, they pulled the plug, sold the station to Minnesota Public Radio. It was a bad time for Eleanor, who told us that this job and living in the Twin Cities was the happiest time of her life. But as we found out, Eleanor Mondale is a survivor. Welcome to the Great American TV Poll. I'm Eleanor Mondale. Hosting the Great American TV Poll on Cable's yes, Lifetime channel is just part of Eleanor's continued media career. These days, the former WLOL DJ is also back on the radio airwaves, jabbering Morning Drive on Chicago's pop rock station Q101. Listen to us on the Playhouse tomorrow morning. I'm Eleanor Mondale. Murphy to my left. Thank you very much, Eleanor Mondale. Have a very good weekend. Away from work, a June wedding is planned for Eleanor and Greg Malbin, who also found life after WLOL in the Windy City. Eleanor says she's content for now and enjoying getting settled in the couple's new home. But for this Minnesota girl, there's still no place like home. I got so spoiled being in Minneapolis with my family and that the job at LOL and everything was so good that coming here, you know, everything pales in comparison. But on paper, it's okay. I want to be on national television and be one of the hosts on a morning show. Hi, Gretchen. Former Miss America and Anoka native Gretchen Carlson is off and running with her predicted television career at WRIC-TV in Richmond, Virginia. But what she did not expect was the continued tabloid media blitz she battled when she wore the crown. Hard Copy recently put her name in headlines reporting an alleged relationship between Gretchen and another newscaster. And while the station management did not renew the anchor's contract, they've stood behind Gretchen and her work as the neighborhood reporter. I still do often think about my little town out there in Lake Wobegon. Minnesota, I was out there for... Uh, and Lake Wobegon's finest son, Garrison Keeler, is preparing for a busy for fall. The humorist, who still lives in Manhattan, kicks off his third 26-week season of the American Radio Company of the Air on October 12th on National Public Radio. And keep an eye out for his latest book, also set to hit the stands this fall. It's called WLT, A Radio Romance. Stay with us. We'll be right back.